sitting on a gold mine. But why do some countries, rich in precious metals, stones or oil, struggle to reap the benefits? You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. An abundance of natural resources can bring great prosperity, but it can also have the opposite effect. Weaker economies and democracies and less development. It's the paradox of plenty, also known as the resource curse. Countries abundant in natural resources are often thought of as the lucky ones, but in reality, the truth can be very different. Natural gifts can be a burden on an economy, tying the fates of a country's citizens to a temperamental commodities market and opening the door to corruption and exploitation. Are natural resources a blessing to be envied or a curse? Some resource-rich countries have struggled with less economic growth, less democracy and worse development. In some cases, internal divisions can lead to violence and authoritarianism. Resources can leave an economy unbalanced as labour and investment becomes geared towards the abundant natural resources, foreign currencies flood the domestic market. Currency appreciation weakens other industries by making their exports unaffordable, a process that leaves countries unable to react to rapid market changes. Dependence on a single revenue stream has become the great struggle of oil-rich countries. Venezuela boasts the world's largest proven oil reserves, but the low oil price means it's finding it hard to pay its debts. While Saudi Arabia is rebalancing its economy away from oil. Those are welcome objectives and that's exactly the kind of transformation that an economy like Saudi Arabia needs. Some countries and regions have found ways to mitigate the damage resource wealth can do. Oil-rich Alaska gives some revenues back to its residents. And Norway uses a sovereign wealth fund to invest in other industries. The resource curse is not a universal experience. Properly managed, natural resources can deliver great financial security. Is good governance the key to unlocking the potential of natural reserves? Can nations learn to take advantage of what should be an economic boon? Very pleased to say we have at the round table today Leif Wenar, who's the author of Blood, Oil, Tyrants, Violence and the Rules that Run the World. We have also Guy Michaels, an Associate Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics and Chiara Ravetti, a researcher in resource-rich economies as she is at the University of Oxford. Leif, let me come to you first of all. Go back to the early 1970s, Venezuela, oil discovered, bags of potential, but the oil minister says it's going to be the ruin of our country. Well, he was right in, to some extent, but what was he thinking of? Natural resources are very valuable. You can imagine it's like there's huge piles of cash buried underground. And if an armed group like ISIS can get that cash out, it can use the money to pay for weapons or to pay soldiers. If an authoritarian regime like Iran or Azerbaijan gets the money out, they can crush dissent. And, of course, if a corrupt official gets the money out, he can spend it on himself. So, for example, the young Saudi prince not long ago spent over half a billion dollars buying a boat for himself on one day. He, he could have bought 2,700 Lamborghinis, but he spent the country's oil money on a boat for his own use. But that doesn't always happen, does it? Well, definitely it can happen, but it's very hard to understand why it happens and how it happens because things can go wrong at so many different stages of the process. So it sounds easy. We have a lot of resources. Let's convert it into sustainable growth for the country. 
Unfortunately, there are lots of steps that the government needs to manage correctly, starting from the explorations to the extraction to setting up deals with the companies to then deciding how to invest the money. And in all these phases, something can potentially go wrong. So I wouldn't talk about one single resource curse, but multiple ways that things can not work as well as possible for these countries. So we should not be too surprised that developing countries are having a hard time managing resources because it's actually a pretty hard management task in a sense. You wouldn't have thought this at first glance, would you? Now, you'd think if, if you discovered oil, you found that you've got a gold mine in your, in your back garden, it's, it's going to help. And it should help, shouldn't it? Yes, I think, I think there are lots of cases where you can leverage uh, these resources to do good things, to encourage development. Um, you know, an example we studied was in the U.S. South, where actually um, early discoveries of oil around Texas and Louisiana and Oklahoma uh, spurred local economic development. So this was a case where uh, it encouraged both uh, upstream industries, so in industries that contributed to the development of the oil and gas sector, like finance and railroads, and also industries that used the, um, the oil and gas, such as petrochemicals. So this was a kind of, you can kind of build an entire, in principle, an entire region around oil discoveries and kind of create lots more jobs than you just would get from those piles of money. But there's a danger too, isn't there? I, I've read, and I'm not an expert in this, that um, let's say you suddenly expand the oil sector, the clever people from other parts of the country and in, in other areas uh, where the country needs their expertise all shift towards that because they're getting better paid, they're asked to do it, it's going to do something valuable for the country, and those other areas of the economy fall down too. That's right. The economists talk about a Dutch disease, why these kinds of resources can be bad for the economy as a whole. Let me just take the broader question first before the economists kick in. When do resources curse? And there's a big dividing line. The big question is, is your government accountable to the people when the money starts coming in? Places like Norway, Botswana, the government is accountable to the people, so the people make the government use the money for the public good. But if the money comes in under the rule of a strong man like Gaddafi, it just makes him stronger. If the money comes in during a civil war like in Nigeria, it just fuels the warring parties. The key is that resources are money, money is power, and unless that power is accountable to the people of the country, the resources will curse. Yeah, well, go into the Dutch disease. Just help us with that one, would you? Yeah, definitely. So this is a phenomenon that has been called Dutch disease because it was first studied in, in the Netherlands when they found gas. And they experienced exactly what you were mentioning, some sort of sectoral shift to the resource industry, which actually had negative consequences on employment and on growth because other manufacturing sectors were shrinking. Part of it, it also pushed up the value of the, of the, the exchange local currency rate. rate, which made exactly made exports more difficult to more sell, more expensive yeah. to sell. Exactly. So these are strictly economic phenomena, which, however, take place in an institutional context. So I definitely agree that the institutional surrounding matters as well. So one important thing to notice about Dutch disease is that it really occurs when you have an, an economy that is at full employment like it was the Netherlands in the 1950s. In developing countries, it, this might not be the toughest constraint. So I have a colleague, for instance, working on Mozambique that made some very interesting recent discoveries offshore, giant discoveries, lots of money flowing in. And this attracted FDI, but it actually created foreign direct investment, foreign direct investment mm -hmm. and it created jobs also in other sectors because the population was not at full employment so people could join the extractive industry which does not employ a lot of people anyways but they could also join the hoteling industry or the construction industry or all these other industries that surround that sector so again it comes back to this management issue are there institutions that allow for a transition to smoothly happen are there bottlenecks or is the economy flexible enough to allow, for instance, migration yeah. to the country where this oil has arrived. So Guy, Guy, you're nodding. Yeah, I think I, I agree. I, th I think I agree with both, both the views. I agree that, um, that the, the politics is really probably the most um, important uh, problem. The institutional setting is, is the most important issue with how to manage oil. And I also agree with the, the kind of the economic linkages, both, both good and bad. On the 
you know, I want to kind of point to two particular properties of, of natural resources. When we talk about natural resources, we don't often refer to agriculture. Uh, we talk about, you know, hydrocarbons, oil, gas, and we talk about rare uh, minerals such as diamonds. Um, and there are kind of two main, main things that make them uh, different. One is that once you've discovered them, the cost of taking them out of the ground is much lower than the value that you would get. So that's what we tend to call rents. They're just, you know, there's just free money um, out there, and that's an important feature. The other feature that characterizes a lot of natural resources is that um, often, as Kiara said, the, the um, extraction process doesn't involve a huge amount of people, and so it's often, hard, it's often easier to hide the amount of money that you're generating in that industry. And that's different from a lot of service industries and manufacturing industries. We've got a lot of people involved, um, and it's harder to hide the money. So both the fact, the existence of these rents, and the fact it's easier to hide them make them problematic. Who wants to pick up on, on this particular point? If, if there's a curse because of bad management, which we could effectively call a tyrant or something like that, but you get good governance and it becomes a boon to your economy, is it very easy to switch it around when circumstances change? No. It's not easy to transition away from oil. Oil autocratizes a country. It makes it more authoritarian. The more oil a country has, the more authoritarian it is, the less likely it is to become a democracy, and the longer an autocratic ruler will stay in power. So you look at Africa, countries like Angola, or Equatorial Guinea, or Gabon, Brunei in Asia, Oman. You see so many countries where there's an authoritarian ruler who just stays in power by keeping control of these holes in the ground where essentially the money comes out and he can do what he wants to keep himself. Are there in people who want to democratize the, the process of having a minerally um, rich country and, and see it filter down to uh, the general population? Have we got examples of that where it's worked? Well, the Arab Springs was a big example. And I mean, we can even go back to the 70s and 80s. There were big democratization processes swiping around the Middle East and Africa. And countries with oil were the ones that transitioned less. The noticeable exception, So you're, you're of agreeing with what Leif is saying to here? To some though, extent, yeah? yes. The more money you've got in your fist, the less likely you're going to be to want to share it. So it is obviously difficult to exactly say it's just the oil's fault. Again, the institutional context matters. So, for instance, with the case of Gaddafi, um, oil was already there. And so it's arguable whether it was the oil that caused Gaddafi to stay in power for 40 years. Well, of course, it supported him. It's very hard, hard to imagine that Gaddafi would have had that much amount of power without the oil. But we cannot really know what would have happened if. So if Libya did not have oil, can we really envisage a completely different growth path? Because growth depends on a lot of things. Development depends on things we cannot measure very well, like traditions and social norms and laws and many things that can work together with oil in making a situation more favorable or less. But it's quite hard to just say um, oil causes a certain outcome. It's usually oil in combination. Is, is, it, it, is it oil or is it also oil, gold, whatever? Absolutely. So let's not talk just about one natural yeah. resource. So I would focus more on re non-renewable resources, so subsoil assets like diamonds, iron, gold, and these other types of minerals, together with fossil fuels, for sure. These things, they are problematic because they finish. So definitely, it's not that they're going to provide money forever. So the country is not richer forever. And this is a problem for development because you want to create sustainable growth. You don't want to just grow for the few years that you have mm. diamonds and then make them disappear. But also it's problematic because they are quite concentrated often and they're easily grabbed. So this can lead potentially to conflicts. But again, we have to be careful because every country experiences quite different situations depending on what the resources are used for. I'll give you the example of diamonds. So diamonds can be either very concentrated in rock beds, and so you mine them with a big, deep pit, and you extract them from there. Or they can be flooded away by rivers, and they come down in rivers, and people can just collect them with little nets. But it's like gold panning. It's exactly. Panning. Very yeah. similar. So these two types of diamonds are very different, because in one case is what Guy was arguing. This is very capital intensive. You need big machines, not a lot of people. And this is actually what Botswana has been doing. This is their mining style, very capital intensive, very tax useful for the government because the government can tax these diamonds very easily. Yeah. 
but the alluvial diamonds, they are very labor intensive, and so they provide livelihood to a lot of people. At the same time, they have been related more to conflicts. But if you want, we can talk about that a bit more. It's it's quite and interesting. Guys nodding in agreement. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think I think that the the institutional backdrop against which these discoveries happen is. I mean that that's that's really key. Um, I mean there were important uh, natural resource discoveries, say in in Norway and in North America. And this hasn't led to a massive deterioration of the quality of government. So, how so if did you start, so if you start off with institutions that are reasonably decent, reasonably yeah. democratic, with strong enough protection for individuals and their property rights, then you can really um, overcome um, a lot of the downsides of natural resource wealth. Jump in here, Dave, if you would, and then I've got, got a question for you. I would state these points a little more strongly. Oil is the real problem. It's the biggest commodity in the world by far, a trillion and a half dollars. And what you see is that oil states are 50% more likely to be authoritarian. They're 200% more likely to be at war with themselves. And if you look at the Arab Spring, one very interesting phenomenon, the countries that didn't have much oil, the authoritarian fell. The countries that had a lot of oil, the authoritarian survived by using the oil money to, to clamp down dissent. And there's only one exception to that, which is Libya, but the rebels had NATO for their air force in Libya. Can, can you lift a curse? The only way that states have gotten out of the oil curse is essentially by running out of oil. You see it in Indonesia. You see it in Mexico. You see it in Nigeria. Once there's less and less oil per capita, then there's less and less money to oppress the people and buy off threats, and then the government has to become more empo empowering of its own people so it can tax them to get Were you surprised evidence. when you discovered this? Because I'm sitting here today thinking, actually, it, it shouldn't be like this at all. Why is it like this? There's one rule that the world uses that we never take notice of, which is a big secret to the oil curse. It seems totally natural, but we actually will buy oil from whoever can control it by force, and that's what sends our money to these oppressive and violent men. So for example, when Saddam Hussein took over Iraq in a coup, it became legal for us to buy Iraq's oil from Saddam. And then years later, when ISIS took over some of those same wells, it became legal for us to buy the oil from ISIS. That's this bad old law left over from the days of the slave trade that puts us into business with oppressive and violent and corrupt men abroad. And that's a big <coughs> part of the oil curse. OK, so we're talking oil here. We're talking gold. We're talking, we're talking diamonds. But someday soon, uh, there's going to come another natural resource that is, that is valued. You could call it uh, rare, rare metals, you know, which are used in mobile phones. Are going to Where do you think the next mm. curse is going to fall? Oh, that's very interesting, and I think many countries should be concerned about this in terms of diversifying their economies right now for what could become stranded assets in the future. So there is a variety, like definitely lithium-ion batteries are calling for nickel and cobalt to be their rare minerals that might, we might be competing with. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo has a lot of cobalt. It's a very war-prone area, so it's very hard to extract it there. But these things are even more concentrated than oil or diamonds or other resources. Um, the issue, though, is that technology also matters. So we, it, it is definitely an issue of what Mother Nature has given you as a country. So you're lucky you're sitting on a pile of diamonds. But there is also a technological aspect to it that we might be able to create substitutes. We might be able to change our technologies. And with lithium-ion batteries, it already happened a bit. So when the price of one rare mineral goes up, the technology shifts to making these batteries with other minerals. So it's not so simple to just say, well, the curse is going to be on one certain mineral. The, the case of Chile was quite, not quite exemplificative of this because it was exporting a lot of nitrate in the 20s and 30s. And it was a fertilizer that was used all over the world. And then suddenly we invented a way to produce these fertilizers chemically with ammonia. So they suddenly found themselves with a huge amount of stranded assets. These mines did not run out of the resource. They just did not have and a market anymore. It. So I'm sort of hoping that with fossil fuels, this is exactly what's going to happen. It has been quite well demonstrated that we cannot burn all the fossil fuels we have. So hopefully at some point they will become stranded assets. But this will have huge consequences for the countries that nowadays rely on them quite heavily. I've studied a bit South Africa and it's a big 
coal producing countries. Mm. It uses it for its own energy, but it also exports it to the rest of Africa. What's going to happen if coal needs to stay under the ground and we find a way to enforce this? There, are, there is a study of nature that says that 80% of coal should be unburnable if you don't want to pass the two degrees target for climate change. And we have so much coal. So unfortunately, compared to oil, which at least is relatively scarce, we can look for more, but it might run out at some point. Coal is definitely too abundant. So hopefully these things will become stranded assets. But for developing countries, there should be a plan to diversify and move out of these resources yeah, if that do, 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 do organizations like the World Bank or the IMF, do, do they help countries in, in this sort of position? What do you think? I, I doubt it. I mean, it's, it, it is a difficult problem because the point is not, I mean, those countries are not short of, of money. They don't just need loans. They need, what they need is, is good advice on how to build sound institutions. And that's, that's very difficult to do because, you know, as Leif said, the people who are in, in control uh, don't often want to relinquish that control. So it's, it's hard to convince them, oh, the whole country will be richer, most people will be happier, but you have to kind of persuade people to gradually let go of, of the level of control that they have. Mm -hmm. So I think the autocrats are definitely one issue. Another big issue is conflict. So we found that uh, when you discover giant oil fields, uh, if there is a pre-existing conflict, then that tends to fuel and exacerbate the conflict, lengthen it, um, and that's, I think, kind of, you know, another facet of it. So if, if one person is in control or a small group, then that they will either oppress or bribe the others as much as they can. But if nobody's in control, then people will fight for it. Were you surprised by anything in particular when you researched your book? The thing that I was surprised by was our own complicity in the resource curse. And we tend to think of it as something that happens to those poor people over there. But let me pick up on Kiara's example. She's absolutely right. Cobalt in the Congo is going to cause a lot of trouble. We need it for our tech. The Congo's war has already killed a million people, maybe up to Holocaust levels. Why is it happening? Let me go back again and say, it could be right now that there's some metal from the Congo in your smartphone and my smartphone. Even if there is, you and I own our phones 100% free and clear under the laws of this country. And some of the money we paid for our phones might have gone back to some of those terrible militias in the Congo who have used sexual violence as a weapon of war so extensively that the Congo has been called the worst place in the world to be a woman. Their violent control over the metals there turns into our legal property here and our money goes back to those men to help them buy more bullets and more bayonets. It shouldn't be legal for us here to buy resources that have been violently extracted well, in other countries. That? We pass a law in our own country peacefully and responsibly no longer to buy resources from authoritarians or armed groups. And that might sound like an ambitious proposal, but let me just mention, as of last week, Brazil has introduced a law saying we want no longer to buy any more authoritarian oil and we're not going to let our national oil company do any more deals with authoritarian regimes. Uh, and can that be uh, economically sound for Brazil or is it going to be, uh, It'll be easy just politically sound? Politically sound and economically sound. The costs are actually quite low. There's a lot of oil in the world. We can do it. We don't need to buy oil and metals from those men anymore. We shouldn't be buying resources from anyone just because they can control them by force. Kiara, we, we, we've talked about the curse and we've talked about what good practices perhaps in Mozambique and Botswana. If anybody's watching this program and, and thinks, well, actually, I'd like to study some other country, see how, see how it's got on, where, where would you point? Well, one interesting case was Malaysia. So Malaysia was very exposed to a lot of ethnic conflicts and it decided to use the oil to specifically boost economic development in an inclusive fashion. So there was a combination of factors. So Malaysia is also located in Southeast Asia and during booming years, of course, it benefited also from the geography of the region. So of course, if you're Mexico and you're trading with the US, you might have an easier time than if you're a landlocked Central African country. So maybe Malaysia also experienced some degree of luck. But at the same time, they really tried to maintain some sort of fiscal discipline. They tried to make development as inclusive as possible. So they cared about the distributions of the rents, which mm. is an issue that is quite complex to, to manage. And it's called a success case. In terms of poverty relief, it has been doing amazing. 
right now it's sort of stuck in a middle income trap. So it's not clear if it's going to be able to really upgrade to, the, to a higher level. However, it has been shown as, as a successful example. Final word, Guy? Well, I think, I think it's really um, a fascinating topic, and I think that there are different, there are common threads, um, but I think, you know, we need to uh, kind of build a kind of better understanding of these different mechanisms. I think we have kind of gradually built uh, some body of knowledge, but I think we still, uh, you know, I, th I still, we, we don't have a kind of a very good answer to tell a country, you know, how do you really reform the, in mm -hmm. the institutions in a way that can really avoid all these problems. Extraordinary. I mean, I, I had no idea this was the case until I started to read about the curse. It, sh it shouldn't be a curse, should it? It, it should be a blessing in disguise. And uh, while oil uh, may not be running out any time soon, our time on Roundtable has come to an end. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you to all of my guests for taking part in this enlightening conversation from me, David Foster, and the team. Hope you can tune in next time. Bye for now.